Welcome back to Godless Reads, the chilling tales for Dark Knight show, where godless authors read their own disturbing, twisted, and subversive tales. I'm Drew Stepik, the unkempt, disheveled, annoying, 90s used car salesman who puts this shit together and introduces it. I'm coming to you live this week from the front of the LA Theater in Los Angeles. It's where they film the opening scenes from Night of the Comet. And why am I shooting it in front of the LA Theater, you ask? Because This week's story by Michelle Von Eschen is about a cosmic experience that creates something bad on our planet. Really bad. What to Expect When You're Expecting is one of my favorite stories this far on Godless Reads. It's very personal and it really, really, really hits you where it counts. So just like in Night of the Comet, when the comet went by and almost everyone died except those who were turned into zombies, Michelle's story really hits that close to home. It also has all the elements of a traditional horror sci-fi story, which will blow you away. You might not be aware of this, but Michelle recently got married to Jonathan Butcher, who you guys remember, Red Chocolate Man, a few episodes ago. They're a real-life indie horror power couple, if there ever was one. Plus. She gets the last name Butcher, which is pretty fucking cool. So kick back, grab your drug of choice, and let Michelle Von Eschen take you into her strange and bizarre world with her story, What to Expect When You're Expecting. What to Expect When You're Expecting. I didn't want to be a mother. I decided that when I was a kid, as my own mother couldn't keep her eyes open to enjoy the dinner she'd slaved over. It was hard work, parenting, or maybe I was a difficult child. Either way, I wasn't interested in a life of exhaustion, and definitely not missed meals. But then I met Mark, and my mind changed almost overnight. A child would be a further expression of our love, another outlet to demonstrate the bond between us. Two wasn't enough anymore. It was time to expand, decorate a nursery, nest, devote every waking moment to new life. It was time to invite the weariness home to stay. We tried for a year and a half, an effort exhausting in its own right, and where a baby didn't grow, there implanted frustration and a need to prove my aging body wrong. We can do this, I'd whisper to it, a whisper barely audible over the cacophonous ticking of my biological clock. When it finally did happen, Mark kept the pregnancy test until we saw the baby on an ultrasound, as though tossing the stick in the trash might somehow negate the biological efforts of our bodies and render me childless once more. I didn't blame him. I wanted to spend nine months at the clinic, lubed up, watching the child grow on the monitor like some slow burn human equivalent of waiting for water to boil. And isn't it true how everything happens at once? We'd been looking to move from our apartment into a house, one with enough room for the three of us, but few options existed within the growing city and our shrinking budget. Turns out babies were expensive, even before they came out of you. What about a farmhouse? Mark asks over coffee one morning, one far from all the chaos and crime. We can't afford a farm. We can, one without animals, without anything. He tosses the newspaper onto the table in front of me, on a page with dozens of completely affordable farmhouses in varying states of disrepair. Why are they so cheap? These lots are huge. Nothing grows there anymore. The dirt's infertile. The word still stings, even though we're beyond it. Mark catches my discomfort and keeps talking. It's not far from here either. We just need to pick one that doesn't need as much work. Cautious optimism, babe. We make the drive up to meet the agent at a listing, getting lost several times because the navigation can't be convinced that anyone would choose to go where we're going. The robotic voice demands we make a U-turn at our next convenience, as soon as possible, before it's too late. Mark yells back there's only one way north. I silently scream that this is the place to dump bodies, not start a family. But forward is forward, and whether there's a forever home or a grave at the end, At least I'll be able to lie down. Hulking farm machinery rusts at the far corners of the landscape, holding down the otherwise empty fields as though they might completely blow away in the wind. 
just as much a part of the ruins, the barns and stables scream for purpose as a gale smack against the weakening wood. Eventually, the house looms on the gray horizon, just behind a battered windbreak of blue spruce. I commiserate with the trees, pushed so far in one direction, under pressure to hold everything together. The agent beams as she steps onto the gravel drive, taking in the vast amounts of absolutely nothing. I'm not smiling. I can barely breathe. Country life in relentless gusts is being crammed down my throat. There's hardly any traffic. It's abandoned, I yell into the wind. Mark smacks my shoulder. I suppose it's inappropriate to undermine the agent's clever spins on the property's inadequacies. She's trying. We've only just arrived. This is the southernmost border of the northern zone. You don't a piece of history. The last pioneers of a now untrodden land. I'll give her that. It looks like history. Every dusty, rotting, falling off piece. The shutters cling for dear life to the weather-beaten siding. The porch sinks on one side, threatening to rejoin the landscape. It's a far cry from the house with all the right angles pictured in the real estate listing. A skinny cat emerges from behind the house and runs to my side, mewing for the food it expects I might have. Mark runs deeper into the yard. This place is amazing, babe. Look at all this open space. It's perfect for a dog. Don't push it. I'll never be a dog person. The cat follows me to the front door. Well, I hope you like cats. This one seems to come with the house. I haven't even said I like the house. Inside, our breath hangs in clouds, vaporous specters haunting rooms long after we tour them. Mark catches me observing the phenomenon. We'll double the insulation, get those extra thick windows, and wear socks to bed. What about the baby? I imagine her in a pink snowsuit, one so puffy she can't move her limbs. She'll lie in her crib like a starfish clinging to a rock, a tiny spread-eagled god sacrificed on an invisible cross for the sake of cheap rent. Kids are resilient, the agent says with a knowing laugh. I look closer at her and recognize something. It's weariness cheek. The bags under her eyes hang lower than the shutters. Her breasts are as used up as the soil. Dust from dry shampoo smatters her thinning hairline. She's a mother, and a glimpse of my future. They survive a lot, Mark agrees. Not hypothermia, come on! Are we really considering this? I know his answer by the look on his face. He's impressed by the agent's conviction in defending the frozen circles of hell she's leading us through. The kitchen, living room, the bonus room, each one colder than the next, and each one presented in order as spacious, open and airy, and great in the summertime. The master bedroom, with its drafty walls, is positively titillating, meaning my nipples are hard as rocks from the bite. Should we show her the nursery? Mark and the agent make eye contact, betraying their plans. I knew it. They're conspiring against me, saving the best for last, fixing a failed dinner with a perfected dessert. I'm given the uneasy pleasure of opening the last door at the end of the second floor hall. I turn the handle with the trepidation reserved for a jack-in-the-box. My teeth chatter. I expect to see raccoons or the bodies of pigeons. I expect to see Satan himself protruding from the frozen puddle in the center of the floor. Evidence of our arrival to the very pit of hell, and a leak in the roof we'll need to address. Instead, I see the view, and it's one for which I'll risk frostbite. Wow. A picture window makes up the entire far wall framing the farmland into a timeless agricultural painting of muted hues and breathtaking peacefulness. Mark skirts the mini ice rink and stands beside me. I knew you'd love it. Couldn't you just stand here forever? Until the cows come home. Someday, perhaps, the cows might. Mark stops the agent with a visible gesture of a hand slicing his neck. My hesitancy drops with the cut, and the room with the view sells me on the place. We'll take it. We'll make it work. My husband can't ever claim I'm not convincible. There are things such as space heaters and changes of heart. A month later, after the difficult intricacies of escrow and estrogen, we sit on the bare floor of the future nursery and prepare to name our child. Mark looks overwhelmed by the task. Do we really need three books? 
The baby needs a name. Yes, one, only one name, Mark reminds me as he holds the thickest of the books. This one has 3,000 names. It's probably in here somewhere. Well, our baby needs two names, technically, a first and a middle, and children grow into their names, so it's a huge choice. We are determining a future here. We're naming a serial killer. Are you going to help or what? My head's down. He doesn't answer. He's already in another room doing something easier, like watching paint dry. I start at the beginning with the A's, and I don't get very far. Ava, a wished-for child. She doesn't even need a middle name. The first one is perfect. At some point, Mark allows the cat inside and it never leaves. He's the color of dirt, and even though I have books full of names, dirt sounds fine to me. Mark vows to call him mud when he's wet. Not yet a dad, and already making dad jokes. My anxiety runs high during the first trimester. The stink of old memories at the apartment, the fumes of the repair work, and the heavy scent of brewed coffee at the farmhouse all snake into my nostrils and threaten to cause a miscarriage. Fever dreams of an asbestos-ridden birthing suite wake me to my own ferocious scratching of my skin. I want out of the apartment, out of my pregnant body. I pack in empty boxes as often as my stomach, as the morning and moving sickness take hold. In the second trimester, things begin to resemble normal. My morning sickness leaves about the same time as we turn in the keys to our old place. Everything is unpacked and tucked away in its new home, including my fears, which have been pushed into a hall closet with a vacuum cleaner. Everything is fine until dirt cries in the middle of the night. So loud I wake and search the farmhouse for the logic and location of his sorrow. He's in the nursery, staring out the big picture window, howling at something hovering above the fields, brighter and bigger than the moon. It's definitely not the cows returning, and through the frame, I feel like I'm watching a movie. I don't like the look of it either, I talk to him, but he doesn't respond to my voice. Instead, he weaves a nervous path between my legs, carrying on with his petite air raid siren all the while. The light brightens until the shapes of the house around me disappear. A beam emanates from the center of the shape, a laser pointer so large the cat dares not seek its capture. In the dark safety of my womb, Ava moves as the ray penetrates, as though she's trying to hide from whatever intrusion we're experiencing. I feel a growing heat at my center. The bun in my oven is on fire. Mark! His name departs with the strength in my legs and my consciousness. I wake on the floor of the nursery, to dirt shrieking at me from the doorway, to something silkier than my nightgown gliding between my legs. Blood. Not enough to rush to the hospital, but certainly enough to send me into a fit of panic calling my gynecologist until the incessant ringing of her phone rouses her. The thing in the field is gone. The room is dark again. My oven is cool. Mark is trying to get by dirt who refuses to let him close to me. I don't know how I got my cell phone. Maybe the pregnancy is making me insane. Maybe the paint is taking brain cells for strength as it dries. Hello? I barely hear the greeting over the hissing of the cat. I try to tell her what I remember, but it sounds a bit too close encounters of the third kind as it comes out of my mouth. Mark is hearing it for the first time, too. Put her on speaker. I do. The changing hormone and stress levels can create a breeding ground for nightmarish thoughts. It's common during pregnancy. I'm sure nothing is wrong. Nothing can go wrong. The walls are painted. We just built the crib. She has a name, Mark adds in the background, where he now struggles to hold the still hissing dirt. How do you feel now? How much blood would you say it was if you could scoop it all up into a measuring spoon? A tablespoon? More? I hadn't thought of collecting it. Right, but if you had, how much would it be? I look at the stain on the carpet, lift my nightgown, and examine my inner legs. I guess only a few tablespoons. Not enough to be an entire life, right? Give it the morning and come in if anything seems different. Okay, I'm not worried. You shouldn't be either. I don't go in, and I somehow manage to avoid the news for a few uneventful days, but Mark catches the chaos from the radio while driving into town for supplies. After unloading the groceries, he strokes my belly and furrows his brow. 
What's wrong? A mass event. Something terrible. I place my hand atop his and wait for Ava to stir. Something that affects the womb. I think of that night. How it felt more like a dream or a nightmare. She's still there. It's okay. I can feel her. But the blood. The doctor said it was fine. The thing you saw. Pregnancy brain. Northern lights. I don't know. What about dirt? He won't come near you anymore without hissing. So now the cat's a barometer for my well-being? I pick at the scabbed scratches on the top of his hand as Mark works at prodding my wounds. Honey, I love you, and I don't want to break your heart, but we need to check under the hood. We need another ultrasound. I keep to myself that my cravings have changed. I want meat. I can smell and hear everything. Things are just different. The cat is right, but I'm not ready to say goodbye to Ava or hello to whatever has taken her place. The next day, by some miracle of scheduling, the gynecologist braces us for bad news. She offers us a grief counselor before she even turns on the imaging machine. I don't speak. Mark leads the interrogation. So? It's exactly like the others, I'm sorry. How does a child disappear? Where does an entire baby go? There is something there. It's just not her. She's been replaced. By what? I can't be certain, but it's dog-like. Four legs, a tail. I'm sure you've been watching the news. A dog? I'm not an animal doctor, by any means, but the structure looks canine. So it's not Ava anymore? It's clearly something else. I'm sorry. Makes sense now why dirt won't come near you. You're harboring the enemy of his people. I'm going to step out and leave you two to process this. Take all the time you need. She doesn't mean the last part, because after ten minutes we're being asked to give the room up for the next devastated couple. Most of the drive home is quiet. The ultrasound picture, a sad party gift, a tragic consolation prize, has fallen between the seat and the door. I make no moves to retrieve it from that place of other dropped and nearly forgotten things. It makes a permanent home there beside a stale french fry, a long missing earring, and my hopes and dreams. Maybe if we'd conceived earlier, the wave would have missed us, and we'd be the one house standing after the tsunami. We could be safe inside with our son or our daughter, braiding hair or playing with cars, holding them close while watching expectant mothers all around us panic over the growing issue of just what was growing inside of them. I snap at the thought of the alien I'm transporting. I want it out of me! I don't want anything to do with it anymore! I go for my buckle and think of opening the truck door. This isn't the end, babe. Things will just be different, says Mark, the eater of the bruised banana, the scraper of the blackened layer of burnt toast, the acceptor of all things in their lesser forms. I don't want things to be different. I want toast that isn't burned to begin with. What? Never mind. My trees bend. Mark is the wind. We wait in the returns line to get back our money for the crib. Other pregnant women bid farewell to their dreams as they hand over receipts for changing tables, diaper genies, and mobiles. Sale signs hang from the ceiling and red clearance stickers cling to everything. It seems a bit preemptive to close an entire industry centered around the future arrival of human infants. Maybe things will go back to how they were someday. They could make this a storage facility until then. And if we never see normal again, then a museum of days gone by. The woman in front of me chats on her phone in some kind of strange, blissful, modern resignation. I'm keeping the baby clothes. I've seen people online who dress up their dogs in onesies, so I'm thinking I can use it all anyway. Maybe open an IG account? I don't even have receipts for most of it. Just another day at the end of the world. We're nearly to the front of the line when something happens to all of us who are expecting. We fall to the floor in unison as our parasites shift aggressively in our bellies, an intelligent, coordinated movement that feels like they're trying to run in a herd. We moan and cry in symphony until the moment passes. The cashier avoids eye contact. I can't take it personally. She's a witness to a war, a minimum wage civilian casualty who returns me without question my money for a crib that we couldn't fit back into its box. I think it's missing screws. 
she shrugs. We all are. I stare at the empty space against the wall where the crib used to be. It stares back at me. I turn my gaze to the window and the fields beyond it. How I ever thought anything could grow here, I don't know. It's all dead. The meat cravings worsen. The movements from inside my womb become violent, predatory, pushing boundaries and testing my strength. I begin fighting back. I stop eating, deny its sustenance. It chews at the walls of its holding cell. I eat sushi every day and only myself end up sick. I drink cases of wine and hit Mark in fits of drunken anger. Nothing I'm willing to do will kill it. Life keeps finding a fucking way. Our marriage suffers. The health of the womb persists. You're not well, Mark says to me one night in the dark of the hallway after I vomited in the toilet. Good. If I'm not well, it means he's not well. Mark slaps my face. I tussle with him hoping he punches me in the stomach, begging him to push me down the stairs. I hadn't conjured the strength to do it myself. He throws me against the wall, forcing more bile at my throat and onto his shirt. God damn it, you smell like an alleyway. I'm grieving, Mark. This isn't grief. This is murder. It's suicide. We lost Ava. I'm not going to lose you two. What am I supposed to do? Learn to fucking love it until we have a better option. I hate you so much. I do, I do. This from my mouth in a sing-song voice that Mark hates. Mark with splinters in his hands from building a dog run in the backyard with the wood left over from reinforcing the fence. Mark with back pain from tearing up the plush carpet of the nursery in order to lay easy clean linoleum. Mark with apparent budding love for this thing that's begun clawing to get out of me. Why are you spending all this energy? and money. Don't you think we should pretend to be excited? Nurture the damn monster? I can cease my attempts at fetal murder to protect you, but it's not in me to read picture books about humans to an alien life form feeding off my body. I mean, think of what it will do to us if we don't coo over it. I don't want it for one second to suspect that we aren't eagerly awaiting its arrival. Mark is right, though I hate the idea. Loving it seems like dishonoring Ava's life and ignoring what could have been. Maybe a bit of her spirit will live on in the creature that consumed her. I survey the mound for signs of life, and it wiggles inside me. Fear it can read my thoughts. I don't want you, but you're what I've got, I say, in the direction of my navel. I pull the baby name books from the boxes in the closet and pour through them for anything fitting of the abomination in my gut. Hundreds of pages, thousands of names, and not one suitable moniker for the beast. I am a woman possessed by an unnameable thing, inhabited in utero by a demon holding on to its power through resolute anonymity. I see a name near the end of the alphabet, and it gives me an idea. You're what I've got, Russ. Russ, huh? Mark asks from the doorway. Short for Russell? Short for Cerberus. He laughs until he sees I'm serious. It's not three-headed. No, but it might as well be, and it's dog-like. Besides, the name means flesh devouring, which fits since it ate our unborn daughter. It ticks all the boxes. Are you drinking again? No, I'm having a moment of clarity, or at least a little fun. Every night of the final week of my pregnancy, I slip out of bed in the house and slither underneath it into the crawl space and beneath the room with the water heater, a pocket of warmth against the bitter twilight. Something about the smell of the dirt there calls to the thing inside of me, like it knows the earth will eventually be his. New territory for his species, a next claim, maybe a final conquest. I can't ignore the draw. Mark spends the first few nights in a camp chair outside, but gives up his watch when he loses feeling in his toes. I wake to cobwebs on my face as the early morning light finds the vent openings of the crawl space. I remember the low ceiling and sit up part way to transition to all fours. It feels good to allow my giant belly to hang. The thing inside of it rolls to get comfortable in a new position and wetness runs down my legs. A cramp pulls me down. Mark! I scream as loud as I can, willing my call for help through the foundation and into a cracked window, 
up through the floorboards and into his ears. I crawl to the small opening. Dirt greets me, hissing, hackles raised, attempting to keep Russ and I in the dungeon where we belong. Get out of here, Mark snaps at the cat, who slinks off with a look back that suggests Mark too should walk away while he can. My water. The baby's coming? Don't call him that. What should I call him? Russ, the three-headed, the child devourer, the bastard son of our new alien overlords? Just take me to the hospital! Mark pushes the boundaries of space-time as he speeds down the gravel lane toward the highway. Maybe we'll get lucky and the truck will hydroplane, lift off, and take Russ back to the stars. Maybe we'll get luckier and travel back in time to avoid the whole thing. There aren't any street lamps this far out, but a car passes on occasion, its headlamps illuminating the pale upholstery of the truck's cab and sending an arc of light across the dome of my belly, like watching night chasing day on a globe. The seatbelt crosses that same surface, gently resting on the biggest part of my abdomen. Russ knows it's there and scratches along the inside of my womb, tracing the edges of the strap. I imagine this differently, with Mark looking over at me lovingly as I labor in the passenger seat, with joy taking hold and displacing any fears we might have. His eyes are on the road, though, and he's somewhere else entirely. I'm in the darkness of the fields as the frost works at covering them. How I'd like the blanket of that long, cold nap. Almost there. Are you doing okay? He snaps me from my dying daydream. I'm scared. I'm not ready to meet him. Don't worry, it'll be just like adopting a dog. Yeah, the one thing I didn't want to do. Vehicles clog the parking lot of the hospital. Sedans, ambulances, news vans, animal control units. Bulbous, grimacing, dirt-covered women limp and waddle through the vestibule like penguins as their partners fight to stay close to them in the shuffle. Mark and I join the flow and let it pull us inward. Between the sets of sliding doors, we're confronted by our own bizarre perfume, and we gag on that mix of soil and fear, blood and amniotic fluid. Once again, the proximity of our wounds throws us into a choreographed lurch, which spills us into the lobby. No, no beds, someone yells from an interior hall. The mob surges forward again, displaced by the size and severity of that information. We're overwhelmed. Over 70 women are in labor here, the front desk woman barks. But he's coming, I bellow, somehow having made it to the front of the rookery. He's coming. The pain of another contraction pushes the words from my throat, transforming me into a terrified summoner of a devil slowly rising from the center of the pentagram I never meant to draw on the floor. If I had a dollar for how many times I've had someone scream that in my face tonight, I'd be raiding the vending machine instead of sitting here putting up with this shit. Mark pulls my arm to lead me away from this fight he thinks I'll pick, but the receptionist is another innocent civilian, shell-shocked by the sight of an invasion. At minimum, she deserves Cheetos. I spot a wheelchair left unattended outside a bathroom door. Neither of us worry about who we've stranded inside. Mark parks me down a hall next to another woman in a similar state as mine. My right arm dangles over the edge of the armrest, and the woman gives my hand a squeeze. It's my first. Her weak voice breaks as she enters another contraction of her own. A name tag stuck to her chest, and crinkling as she rides, reads Rachel. I don't know if she means her first child, or her first live birth of an alien being. Ripples and mounds move beneath her shirt. Claws form tiny peaks as they push toward the surface. I feel like I'm dying. You aren't dying, Rachel. It's going to be okay. I'm grateful for her as a distraction from my own predicament. She's gritting her teeth as discs of blood bloom and expand on the cotton landscape. They told me it would hurt. This is normal, then. This is normal. Breathe through it. I rest a hand on her belly, applying gentle pressure to slow the bleeding. I look for Mark. He's down the hall, hailing passing medical staff like taxis, but no one wants a spare. My hand is wet. She needs a doctor! The taxis continue to fly by, the Lamaze breathing as a home med kit band-aid clinging to the wet, bulging edges of a complete evisceration. Her breathing falls behind. 
It might be making it worse. The expansion pushing everything up in a way like geysers. I place my other hand where it looks the most red as I try to think back to birthing class. To the part of the course where they prepare you for bleeding out through your abdomen. It must have been the week Mark and I had to skip because of car trouble. Breathe. Remember what they taught us. I breathe with her, trying to calm myself with every exhalation, wishing I could forget all of this. Her breathing changes pattern, a sputtering engine losing steam before stopping altogether. I can feel the claws on my palms. Her beast child makes its final moves to break out of its shell, where it ends up tangled in her bloodied shirt. My hands slip on the grip of the wheelchair. I can't roll away, stuck at the scene of the crime, thinking of ways to explain the blood on my hands. It's crawling out of her! I scream to the passers-by, but they're tending to their own chest bursters. I wet myself, my bladder no match for the combination of terror and tensing as a contraction rocks me. Suddenly, my wheelchair is moving away from the dead girl, merging into the traffic of the hall. Good news, you skipped the line, the pusher says. That girl with the exit wound was next. I look behind us and see Mark rushing to catch up. A doctor turns us away from the birthing suite. Not this room, the operating room. She needs a C-section. They all need C-sections. I don't want a C-section. That wasn't part of the plan. They already have me on a table. Listen, you're going to end up with a cesarean either way. That mini Freddy Krueger you finished brewing under your nightgown will make shredded beef of your insides if you don't let me cut you open with a scalpel. Your choice. Mark, tell them I don't want a C-section. Babe, none of this is to plan. It's okay. Let them do their work. Mark's no longer eating bruised bananas. He's making full-on banana bread compromises. I can feel the sharp needles pressing upward toward the bright light of the medical lamp. I close my eyes and I am transported to that night in the nursery. The spaceship is above the field. A beam penetrates my womb, illuminating it like a sphere of amber. Our hellhound, the bug within. I don't like the look of it, I scream as something touches my legs. I expect to see dirt there, circling, but I'm back at the hospital where the surgeon is fussing with the stirrups. The look of what? Don't worry. This is perfectly normal. He assures me as he dons thick leather gloves, which nearly meet his shoulders. But I'm having a dog, doctor, not a falcon. The labor team releases nervous, pre-show laughter. I make a mental note regarding my deathbed hilarity. It's a shame you only die once. Remember that for the funeral, Mark. The falcon joke. For the eulogy. Shh, honey. Don't say things like that. You aren't dying. That's what I told the girl in the hall, but she was. Look. I lift my still bloody hands to show him as the invader is tugged from my body, and for a few brief moments, I feel free again. Mark cuts the umbilical cord and skips the opportunity to stab the thing to death. Russ struggles in the nurse's arms, a dog not yet trained to be held. I wish the whiplash from the sudden snap back to reality would have killed me. I could do with a broken neck right about now. Congratulations, he's beautiful. The words, a habit from decades of running the maternity ward, fall out of the doctor's mouth before he can catch them. I'm too stunned to argue. Russ and I stare at each other with wild eyes of the same shade of blue. It's the only resemblance I can see. His skin is black and scaly, with small tufts of randomly distributed fur poking out. His tail shrinks and grows at will. His face and shape is dog-like but in an off way, like a child's drawing come to life. I don't like the look of it at all. I don't think you're the father, Mark. It gets a morose chuckle out of him. The nurse smiles. The doctor wisely opts for silence. What's his name? The nurse asks. Russ, Mark offers. Ah, a popular name lately. My ego deflates like my womb. I'm not even as clever as I thought. Would you like to hold him? No, we reply in unison. Okay, then we're gonna kennel him and close you up and then maybe we can find you a room. I lie on the operating table and mistake the glow of the lamp for sunlight. The urge to leave overwhelms me. Mark leans in for my whisper. How much time do you think we have until you choose through the metal? I don't know, but as soon as they wheel you out of this room, we're making a break for it. 
Mark and I escape shortly thereafter. He pushes me in the same soiled wheelchair from before the birth. We squint against the sunlight and find a way through the battlefield at the front lawn of the hospital. Bodies of women, torn to pieces, make it a difficult path. Russ whines and barks behind us, already free of his cage. He reaches the truck as we pull away. Drive! Drive! A small pang pulls the walls of my heart together as I watch Russ chase the car in the rearview mirror. How desperately he wants to be near us. How fervently he nips at our heels. We break away from the repetitive blocks of the city into the calmer suburbs and finally back to the fields of the north. Somewhere behind us, Russ runs without rest. Mark slows the truck to a more acceptable speed. My abdominal incision aches and leaks blood through my shirt. A red, frowning mouth above my groin, echoing my sentiment on the whole absurd affair. An hour after we arrive home, Russ bursts through the doggy door, his internal homing beacon more accurate than the truck's GPS system. He finds me on the couch where I'm resting, wraps his elongated tail around my neck until I'm gasping for breath, and tears through my shirt to nurse. It's a relief at first for my milk-filled breasts until he begins to gnaw. I tell him no, as forcefully as I have the energy to, and he lets up enough for me to not fear my life. I lose as much blood as milk and pass out from the trauma. I dream of leaving him on the steps of a faraway church or at the edge of the yard in a cardboard box emblazoned in black marker. Free to a good or bad home. Days later, dirt disappears as suddenly as he showed up so many months ago. Eventually, I find his collar bloodstained and abandoned in the front yard. I bend to pick it up, and Russ drops a bone at my feet. Something scavenged from the farmland around us. It's human. A temporal bone. Less a gift. More a warning. Mark takes it from me and flings it across the yard like a frisbee for Russ to bring back. They play tug-of-war. Really? Aren't you concerned? He probably found a graveyard. It'll be your skull soon. I abandon them in the yard and I cry as I throw Dirt's collar and any lingering bits of optimism into the trash. It's all caution now, and all I wanted was that cat and Ava and that picture window. I didn't expect this. I train myself to get out of bed every day despite the depression. I train Russ to sit. Mark trains himself how to shoot the gun he's purchased by turning the spruces into the receiving end of a range. But then he reads online that the beast child's skin is bulletproof and boxes up the firearm for good and starts taking Russ on walks. Russ runs circles around me when he's hungry, keeping me from anything other than feeding him. When he herds Mark and I together, he wants us to mate, threatening us with his elongated tail until we're in the act, choking Mark if he loses his erection too soon. It's hard to be turned on when we're forced into sexual servitude for the procreation of an alien race. We scrub shit and saliva off the baby pink walls of the nursery, and we settle into our bizarre routine of demented domesticity. My motherly masquerade and Mark's fatherly farce, both sweeping brushstrokes in our discount American Gothic. The stitches in my abdomen haven't even dissolved before I'm pregnant again. Russ knows before anyone. We waste no money on a test. It's confirmation enough the way he stares up at my belly, the noises he makes at the new life inside of me, and eventually, the howling calling back from within. Once more, my womb expands, and I feel the urge to return to the dirt beneath the farmhouse to rest. Russ sleeps beside me, guarding the life in me which belongs more to him than Mark or I. In the house above, in another world, Mark reads late into the night, pouring through speculation on the alien's Achilles heel, searching for ways to kill Russ before the wandering strays and boneyards no longer satisfy his growing hunger, before the twins arrive and we are outnumbered, before the beings who place this plague upon us land for the final invasion. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? 
Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications.